Wonderful. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, as um, I was so wonderfully introduced there, thank you. I am um, the founder of Stress Matters and that's where my kind of hat is for you today. So um, I do work as a coach and I work on group coaching programs for um, people in our industry as well. But today I'm here with my Stress Matters hat on and the reason is I imagine probably quite obvious that mental health and well-being has been kind of thrown to the forefront recently. So from my side, obviously, I've been hugely um, concerned and focused on it for the last few years. But with everything that's happened over the last kind of 10, 11 months, actually, um, I think we're all feeling the kind of the personal impact and the um, situation has really hit home for us as individuals, um, but also, of course, our teams as well. So um, as you said, I'm a big believer that success doesn't have to be stressful. And the reason I think that is because actually I've gone through um, periods of what I would refer to as burnout myself. I've had team members go off on sick leave with stress, but actually I know that you can turn a company around and you can change your mindset so that you're not prone to it. So where actually quite often we think in our industry because it's so customer focused that actually we're at their mercy and actually the stress is inevitable because of course the pressure we're under with deadlines. But I don't believe it has to be that way. So we work with different businesses and across the kind of industry with associations to try and help educate people about how we can do things in a slightly better way. So I wanted to share some stats with you first of all, um, but I'm conscious of the fact that I don't know you guys. So um, whilst we're using chat for questions, I would also like to get you to guys to use chat for what I think is probably one of the most important questions of the day which is asking you, how are you doing at the moment? So um, I would love to say, let's all um, get ourselves off mute and have that chat, but unfortunately I am conscious of time. So I'm gonna ask you to put it in the chat box. I'd like to know how you are doing today. Now, for me, as I said, it's one of the most important questions that we can ask every single day. Not only is it a question we should be asking ourselves, but of course, asking our team members as well. So I'm sure we probably all ask everybody, oh, how are you doing? Um, and inevitably, most often the answer is, yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm all right. And then we leave it at that. But actually, it's one of the most powerful questions we can ask. And if we give people the space to answer properly and honestly, and sometimes if we actually encourage that conversation by being honest ourselves, we have a far deeper connection with people but it also means that we can really find out how people actually are doing. So I'd love to hear how you guys are in the chat and take that question away and ask yourself, if you don't want to ask yourself right now, how are you doing today? Not how are you doing generally, how are you doing today in this moment? Are you having a good day? Actually, are you quite tired? Is it a frustrating day? What are you feeling today? So as I said, I was going to share some stats with you. So I don't know um, how much you track the data in your teams and how much you're kind of really aware of this yourself, but it's been found that over 50% of the days that um, individuals are often sick leave from work is actually down to stress, anxiety or depression. Now, it's um, some of the stats that show up to 57%. So we've gone with 54, which is where um, I get that from a couple of sources, but yeah, has been reported as high as 57%. Now, it's one of those things to ask you, do you actually track this? Do you find out whether or not your team members are off with um, stress, anxiety and depression, or is it more of a physical illness? Now, the likelihood is they probably don't tell you and they probably don't even know themselves. Quite often, if someone says, I'm sick, actually, it might be a stomach ache, it might be a headache, for example. And as we know from this stat, actually, it's quite likely that's going to be down to stress, anxiety or depression, even if that individual doesn't know it themselves. And stress, anxiety, depression, mental health, well-being, this whole big area is really important for us as businesses, even at this time where obviously money is not coming in very freely. Actually, it's a really important time because even in a non-pandemic year, it costs on average just over £2,000 per employee, regardless if they have a mental ill health um, condition. Actually, just on average across all of your employees, anything ranging between £1,700 and £3,500, depending on the sector um, and the level, so the kind of the job role that they work in, um, per year in ill mental health. So it's a huge chunk of our budget that isn't in a budget line. So it's really important for us to be aware of what we can do for our teams to be able to actually improve the profitability of our businesses. Now, as I said, quite often that will be down to um, absence. So if you think about, you know, especially in the last year, I imagine there's probably quite a few of us that have gone, oh, I can't be bothered today. I really don't feel like it. And some of us have pushed on. 
And some of us have tried to do something but probably haven't had the most productive days. And that's what we call presenteeism. So actually when you essentially turn up for work, whether or not it's in a venue or if it's you know working from your laptop at home, but actually aren't contributing hugely to the day because quite frankly, you should probably be off sick that day. And the cost of presenteeism is far greater than when actually people don't turn up for work that day because they are sick. And of course, when we think about um, the costs of mental ill health as well, actually staff turnover comes in there. So when we've got high staff turnover because our team members are really struggling, that cost gets attributed. So we're looking here at a team of about 100 people um, and the kind of costs that you would um, imagine um, seeing. But of course, you won't see them, as I said, on a budget line um, for your venue. Actually, these are going to be costs that are spread out across other parts of your budget. But I wanted to make it clear that actually it is costing us um, money, our poor mental health and well-being. Now, I mentioned well-being, um, and of course, when we talk about mental health, some of us quite um, have quite a lot of stigma around the words mental health. I'm not going to ask you to share your kind of opinions on those words right now, but for a lot of people, you wouldn't be alone if you hear the words mental health and think negative. Um, and actually, one of the things that we always try to remind people is mental health is just, it's a term. We all have mental health. We all have physical health. We all have mental health. Sometimes we have ill mental health, exactly like we might be physically ill. It's exactly the same, but we all have mental health. But there's a little bit of stigma still um, around that phrase, which is understandable because of all the experiences we've had potentially with media in the past. Now, when we talk about well-being, actually well-being includes physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So quite often you'll hear the terms mental well-being mental health, well-being, you're probably asking yourself, what does that all mean? Well, actually, well-being kind of encompasses everything. So if you think about the fact that actually you might have um, had a sports injury or hurt yourself, maybe your back hurts, for example, the likelihood is it probably makes you feel a bit rubbish and actually it can start to impact on our mental health as well. So a few years ago, I had a skiing accident and so my knee um, needed um, an operation, but actually the impact of that meant that actually I felt really isolated because I couldn't go anywhere. Um, I wasn't independent anymore because actually I needed somebody to bring me things throughout the day. And it started to wear down on the rest of my health as well as just my physical health. So when we think about um, ourselves and our team, it's important to remember that all of these areas are completely connected, which is why you'll have seen that BBC talk about that kind of um, loneliness factor of people that have been shielding or people that live on their own. And you may well have experienced this yourselves. Actually, that's because it comes part of our spiritual and emotional well-being. If we don't feel connected to other people, it can impact all areas of our well-being. So there are kind of four things that I wanted to kind of give you today as um, things to think about. So um, we at Stress Matters run a pledge scheme for um, events, hospitality and tourism industry. And the kind of the essence behind that is to say to you, right, let's have a benchmark of where you guys are at, at the moment. Right? So do you know how your team are doing at the moment and how they're really doing at the moment? So whether or not you carry out some kind of employee checks, whether or not you ask that simple question of how are you doing, understanding how teams are at the moment are really important. And of course, being able to benchmark any impact you try and have and how successful that impact is as well. One of the things we find a lot, um, and particularly at the moment because of the situation we're in, is people are trying to be very reactive to people's mental health and well-being, which is good because it means we're paying attention and we're taking notice. But unfortunately, actually, all things like this, being proactive is far more um, impactful long term. So actually thinking about what your well-being plan is across the year. It's no good just saying, right, we're going to do a one hour stress workshop and hope that solves all of our problems for the mental health and well-being of our teams. Actually, we want to be thinking about what can we do throughout the year to really support ourselves and our team members well-being there's something which you might have heard of called mental health first aiders they're really useful to have um, across your team whether or not it's in the venue and helping um, actual customers as well as your staff so mental health first aiders exactly like it sounds like people that are trained to understand the signs and symptoms of poor mental health but most importantly how to help those individuals as well we run a scheme that's free to uh, kind of just to join which is called mhfa every event so we're trying to support the industry and say actually we want um, venues and organizers to be making sure that everybody feels comfortable um, whether or not you're um, an overnight visitor whether or not you're a delegate whether or not you're a staff member that actually there's somebody looking out for you in every place you go for your mental health not just your physical health
And think about the support that you provide for your team as well. So thinking about actually, do you look out for their well-being? Of course, we know about breaks. We know about the kind of the mandatory requirements in terms of legislation, health and safety. But actually, what are you doing to really understand at the moment in the situation we are, how the team are doing, the kind of different types of support they might need? So the kind of things to um, think about and to kind of from our experience to share with you, when the wellbeing plans have been successful, it's when they're actually all inclusive. So everybody's been involved in that process. So think about whatever you do, actually, can you make sure um, not necessarily all sitting in the same room at the same time, because obviously that's not practical, um, but thinking about that everybody is involved in a way that makes sense for them but still giving people the opportunity to um, look at what they need from um, you as a team member, as a manager to support them. So actually thinking about actually, well, somebody might be all over their own physical well-being in their personal life. They might be fit as a fiddle um, physically, but somebody else might actually need a little bit more support of that in the workplace. And the same with that isolation. Some people might have a really good support network around them and other people might feel like actually their only support network is their colleagues. So how can we support people in different ways? And lead from the top. Actually, it's really hard to create culture change around uh, mental health and well-being if it's not being brought into from the top of the organisation. Think about that. So the kind of challenges is what are when um, things are put into place but not communicated well. A bit like anything, you know, if you try and put a plan in place, people need to know about it and need to understand why you've chosen to do something. Um, thinking about, as I said, making sure that it's not a one off thing. If we do something like support mental health awareness day or support um, international stress awareness week, that's great. And it's a great signpost in the sand. But also what it kind of implies is that we only care about somebody's mental health and well-being one week or one day a year. So think about what you can do to support people throughout the year um, and think about how you prioritize your budget. So I'm fully aware, of course. Um, that budgets are extremely tight and non-existent at the moment, but also it's the time when people need their mental health and well-being supported more than ever. So think about actually how you prioritise your budgets. So there are five areas that we um, recommend thinking about, and this works really well on a personal level, but also kind of to talk about with your teams as well. So we call it the thrive, not survive approach. And essentially there's five areas. So you've got energy, movement, connection, rhythm, and kindness. So we can generally look at ourselves. And of course, as I said, with your team members as well, and this does actually work for um, thinking about our customers and our delegates to events as well. Um, thinking about how do we take into account these five areas in everybody's experience of a day? So actually think about, do you work to your energy levels? Do you encourage people to manage their own time and diaries? Of course, shifts allowing. Do we allow people to move, but not so much that they're exhausted? So finding that balance around movement. Connection being really important, particularly in the world um, that we are in, in terms of actually people want connection with other people. But of course, internally at the moment with the way we're working, if we're working from home rather than in a venue, actually, are we over connected with people? How do we think we can um, take into account that consideration? Thinking about the rhythm, the fact that we don't know what's going on and we have to kind of just roll with it a little bit. And for some people, that's really anxiety driving. Um, and for other people, actually, they quite like the thrill of it. And kindness as well, a really important one. So being kind to yourself, um, but of course, being kind to other people. So thinking about trying to take yourself out of your moment of panic, your moment of worry and think, what can I do? to show kindness to somebody else. So there's been so many lovely things that people have done over the last kind of nine months or so to show kindness, because actually there's scientific evidence to prove that if we are kind to other people, it makes us feel good. So we, even if we want a selfish way of um, thinking about it, being kind to others really does help ourselves as well. And just to finish off for you, we have some free checklists on the website that might be of interest to you. So thinking about um, workplace wellbeing, but also mental safety at events. And that can, of course, go into um, ven uh, venues and actually um, attendees um, at an event as well. So have, feel free to have a look at those. Um, we've got lots of kind of support and advice, um, lots of free kind of um, resources essentially available on the website. And if you um, want to have any questions, and hopefully you've been putting them in the chat to Claire anyway, but I am here to answer any questions in terms of mental health and wellbeing. Thank you, Laura. We do have a couple of questions for you. Wonderful. So, do you anticipate there'll be a rush of mental health issues for employers to face when the industry reopens and people return to work or will people just slot back into place? Good question. I don't think it's going to be a rush as such because I think a lot of them are probably already happening. 
um, I think it's actually how aware we are going to be of them. But yes, we know there's data to prove that um, mental health illness is on the increase. So um, we did, uh, so we, um, MIND did a study last year, um, and that was obviously only really, you know, who knows, say halfway through the pandemic, um, that actually depression had increased in adults in the UK. So we know mental health illness has increased because of the pandemic. Um, so I think that there is definitely going to be an impact on workplaces um, as we kind of come back into action. Um, but I think the likelihood is actually some of those individuals are already struggling and already suffering with that mental health illness. They might not know about it yet. They might not know it's an illness. Um, and you might not know if you've not asked, but I don't think it's necessarily they're going to suddenly restart. Um, at, uh, sorry, as soon as the industry restarts, that's when people are going to become unwell. I think that's probably already there anyway. Okay, thank you. And how should employers manage mental health issues as they must respect the privacy of individuals, but others in the business may need to know about a person's mental health situation? Okay, so first challenge would be, why do we need to know about somebody's mental health um, illness? Um, do we need to necessarily know about people's physical health and illness? So I think quite often we think about mental health, it's really useful to sometimes switch out the word depression or anxiety or mental health, for example, with backache or broken arm, for example, and think, actually, do we need to know or do we think we need to know because it's something that sounds so unknown? So first of all, I would challenge that and say, why do we need to know? Um, but in terms of um, kind of confidentiality, what I would say is that this is why we kind of try and talk about things like culture change, because if the culture in your team and your organisation is actually, you know, we support our team members, whatever the situation is, we are leading from the top, we are being open and honest about people's mental health and well-being, and we're saying that, you know, it's okay not to be okay every single day, then actually um, there's no reason why people need to feel like they need to hide something. Actually, if you can create a culture where people are a bit more open, exactly as you probably say, I've got a cold or, you know, I'm feeling a bit fluey today or whatever it is. What we want is people to be able to say that about their mental health as well. Now, of course, there's so much stigma still at, at, kind of around it at the moment, but that's one of the things that we kind of urge you to do is to think about how can you remove some of that stigma so that actually people can talk about it honestly, because if you don't talk about it honestly, that's when it becomes a hidden topic of conversation and it becomes more challenging for people to deal with. So I'd say try and create the culture change, which I appreciate is of course not easy and takes its time. Um, but by asking some really just open questions like how are you doing and you know what can we do to help rather than making assumptions, actually we can really have quite a positive impact on people's recovery. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Do we have I don't have any other questions. Does anybody have any other questions? <laughs> Julian. Can I can I lob one in? Um, okay. <laughs> You can open up an absolute can of worms when you say, how are you? <laughs> so, so I'm just, I'm just wondering the, 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 the uh, extent or the degree of training, um, Laura, that, that somebody needs in order to, in order to ask that question and, and be, be ready to answer it or to deal with it in an informed way. And, and, you know, training is training is training, but, but I'm not sure whether it's, you know, is this a, a, a two year course or a two week course? What, what does that look like in terms of time commitment to, 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 to be qualified, certified? That's a really good question. Thank you, Julian. So essentially what I would say is it's a question anyone can answer regardless of training. Um, but it probably does come down to how um, strong an empathy level we have. So actually, if you kind of say to yourself, I'm actually probably not particularly empathetic and I'm not a great listener then of course you're probably not going to be best placed to have a really honest conversation with somebody. So actually, if you're the kind of person that's naturally quite empathetic and feel like you're quite a good listener, and you can tend to tell that by who shares with you. Do people actually open up to you in your personal life, for example? That's when we can tend to tell whether or not we are a good listener, because we aren't, unfortunately, all good listeners. Um, so if you are, then great. Actually, it's only a simple question. We don't need to have official training. However, of course, if you don't feel that confident, there are things you can do. So we would suggest listening training. And what we, we run a workshop called Building Connection and Empathy. Um, so it's trying to actually understand what it means to be empathetic rather than sympathetic um, and the difference. Um, but also the Mental Health First Aiding um, qualification. So we're accredited by Mental Health First Aid England to run that MHFA courses. So becoming a Mental Health First Aider essentially gives you those improved listening skills, but it also gives you the kind of what we call the process, the action plan of how to help somebody. So 
if you proactively reach out to somebody because you're a bit worried about them and we talk about the kind of things to look out for and actually they say do you know what i'm not okay or maybe they come to you in what would be a great situation they come to you and said i'm not okay um, i don't know what to do what we do in the mental health first aid course is we basically talk you through the action plan of what you need to follow and essentially what we refer to is the signposting so we're not training anyone to be a therapist that's not the job actually what we're doing is we're saying to you no, this is how you can support somebody in the moment. So exactly like with physical first aid, you, in physical first aid, you don't get taught how to be a doctor or a surgeon. You get taught to how to help person in that moment and how to get them to a hospital, for example, if that's what's needed. And it's essentially the same for mental health first aid. So we're teaching you how to have those initial conversations, how to help people in the moment, and then whereabouts to kind of direct them to. And the mental health first aid course that we run is essentially four mornings. So it's a very short period of time in terms of actually you're talking about a couple of hours each morning in terms of what we call self-study. So doing um, an online portal type learning and then it's two, two and a half hours of a group uh, live session as well. So at the end of the four days, um, you basically become a mental health first aid England, um, mental health first aider accredited by mental health first aid England. You have your certificate, workbook, manual, all of those wonderful things. And you have hopefully at that point the confidence to be able to have those conversations so it's one of those things that yeah there is a course you can do there's a couple of different things you can do but the very basic nature of asking someone how they're doing hopefully if we feel like we're prepared to answer that you know we have that open conversation we don't need training to answer ask that one question brilliant thank you laura that's really kind no worries